Okay, well, it looks like we have a reasonable number of people in place. So let me introduce myself again. My name is Stefan Haggard. I'm the director of the Korea Pacific Program at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. And I'm really happy to be chairing this uh, seminar on the BRI. Uh, but I also want to just highlight one other role that got me into this particular project. I'm the editor of the Journal of East Asian Studies. And this project was brought to me by Professor Minier um, at Boston University. And, and it was really just a terrific proposal about uh, trying to get at the politics of BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, in a more nuanced and complicated way and to spot, spotlight some of the top research that was going on among scholars of her cohort uh, on this topic. So uh, for those of you who don't know GPS, uh, just a quick introduction. We have a series of degree programs, including an MSEPA degree in the study of China. If you're interested, uh, please uh, look at our website and can provide information on that. And also in the chat, you'll see a link to this special issue of the Journal of East Asian Studies where these papers were published. And so what we're gonna be doing today is basically introducing some of the core papers from this symposium on the Belt and Road Initiative that was organized by uh, Wei Yixi and uh, Minye. So let me introduce our speakers very briefly and just tell you about uh, the uh, way we're going to proceed. Uh, first of all, um, Minye is Associate Professor of International Relations at the Party School of Global Studies at Boston University. Uh, she's a graduate of both Peking University and Princeton University. She has her PhD from Princeton. She has a new book on the BRI actually, which came out with Cambridge in 2020. That's a good read. And she has other papers in the Journal of East Asian Studies on the origins of China's reform and opening, in particular, a particularly interesting piece on the role that Hong Kong entrepreneurs played in that process. Uh, next, we have our very own Wei Yi Shi, <coughs> professor here at GPS. Uh, she's been working on uh, foreign capital outflows from China, uh, both in the form of portfolio and foreign direct investment. She's collaborated with uh, researchers at Tsinghua University and the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade. And she's a member of the China Data Lab here. And finally, uh, a congratulations is also in order to Audrey Wong, who has just taken up a position at the, at the University of Southern California. Uh, her research focuses on inducements and constraints in China's foreign policy. Uh, she has a great piece in this collection that she'll talk about on Australia, which is really a kind of canary in the coal mine for these kinds of influence attempts. And she has a book project which examines the strategies and effectiveness of economic statecraft, Chinese economic statecraft, and again, with a focus both on inducements and constraints. So uh, thanks very much to all of you for joining and to Audrey, Wei Yi, and Min Ye. I'm gonna turn it over to Minye, who will introduce us to the topic of today. We'll talk for about 20 minutes. Uh, then we'll do a short round table. I'll have some questions, but if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and I'll be monitoring the Q&A. And if there are questions which are clarifications, I'm happy to pose them. Uh, and if not, we'll get to those questions in the second half of the hour. Again, thanks very much for joining us. Minye, floor is yours. Well, uh, uh, thanks to everyone uh, attending today's uh, seminar. I also want to thank Steph, um, Audrey, and uh, Wei Yi for leading, joining me in today's session and the China Center for organizing this event. Uh, so the, this uh, journal uh, special issue, it's, a, it, it's really a collective work. Uh, and it's, uh, it's so much fun to work with uh, um, uh, colleagues uh, 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 in the US and, uh, and China and across different diff disciplines. And you guys can see that the papers covered are really from different perspectives. And uh, that's one of the goal that uh, we try to achieve in the issue is surrounding BRI to create a collective story on China's domestic politics and how domestic sources shape its external behaviors 
uh, and the, the way its external investment and behavior goals uh, affect the external perceptions and reactions. So the two papers, the research done by Wei Yishi and Audrey Wang will highlight how the Chinese external behavior uh, uh, influences uh, reactions to, to China as the uh, investment power. So I will uh, introduce the, the, my paper, but also the other two papers that really unpacking the domestic story. Uh, what are the domestic institutions and how the domestic institutions influence China's investment behavior. Okay. Um, so the uh, first paper uh, is uh, uh, by me. Uh, it, it, uh, the, the title is Fragmented Motives and uh, Policies, uh, a, uh, the Belt Road Initiative in China. So my goals uh, were both <laughs> ambitious and uh, modest. Uh, I just want to present a very complete uh, story on the, on the process of uh, BRI from the Chinese uh, perspective. So I look at the state system, uh, the party state, the national level bureaucracy and local governments and how the power relationship uh, interact in this party state system and how the system affects fragmented or result in fragmented implementation uh, in China. Uh, so the, the state system, I hope this formula can be useful for others who conduct investigation into China's uh, uh, domestic institutions, is I see the Chinese state as a, a, a consisting of three blocks, the party leadership, who typically sets the directions and the big overarching uh, messaging on the BRI and perhaps other major foreign policy as well. And then we enter a rather self-interpreted national policy making process in Beijing. And then in the Chinese system, the implementers tend to be local governments and state owned capital. So they have their own commercial interests to take care. So these, the, the structure itself really shapes a fragmented implementation. But the Chinese system also policy has a process. So in the BRI process, we see fragmented implementation follows national rhetoric mobilization. And yet indeed there were there are a feedback loop. Right, so the, how the, the, the external recipients respond to the BRI investment projects that typically got channeled back to Beijing and affects uh, policy recalibration and uh, adjustments. So this piece really, number one, offer the framework of three block and the, the policy loop to study BRI, but hopefully it also offers some uh, transferable uh, framework to study other things. And the other two uh, piece uh, in the, in the uh, domestic sources side, I, I really enjoyed working with these authors as well. So the second piece uh, called the globalization of China's coal industry written by Professor Bo Kong uh, from University of Oklahoma and uh, Kevin Gallagher, my colleague at BU. So they look at the uh, 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 bureaucracy and industry uh, complex. So the, 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 the study uh, look at the post-2008 China's rise of uh, um, coal uh, investments in coal-powered plants uh, overseas. So why that was a case. And so they look into the process of uh, industrial planning and debates by the National Development and Reform Commission uh, Council. Uh, and then the uh, coal king actors, you know, this big coal uh, state capitals and their needs to uh, uh, survive while addressing their technology upgrades and environmental um, uh, 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 pressure. And so that the, the, uh, uh, the China the financing uh, in the overseas coal power plants offered uh, it, the 
the, the convenient ways for this uh, industry and bureaucracy to achieve both environmental and uh, uh, industrial upgrading needs. And then the second piece uh, or the third piece, uh, look at the localities. So our author from China, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University uh, research team on economics and uh, um, environment of BRI. So uh, Professor Ying Hai Tao and his team wrote this piece called the localized implementation, the economic and environmental impact of the BRI. So they really look at the local governments when they were facing environmental targets um, and, and their, 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 uh, their logic of investing, uh, polluting, producing industry abroad actually did not work in the Chinese local uh, environment. Both number one, the local governments want to maintain employment locally and the Chinese industries in the localities also had a huge transaction costs of investing abroad. So BRI allowed these actors actually to uh, export uh, polluting industries, the pollution generating goods rather than investing in those sectors. So the outcome is the uh, exports increased and yet uh, the pollution was kept locally. So I really like the, uh, the, the, uh, their findings. Uh, so they, they, they checked that the, the prices of these polluting goods like textile, chemicals, uh, leather, rubber, uh, and, and the, the, the pricing index to show that the BI worked for, for, their, for their economic logic, but the, the cost of the environment was also quite a dear. So again, uh, uh, really explaining the local logic and the patterns of BI investment and the locality. So now let me uh, uh, turn the mic to my colleague, uh, Professor Wei Yi Shi. Uh, thank you, Min. Uh, let me also first start by uh, thanking the authors of the issue and, and thanking my co-editor, uh, Min Ye, for pushing us along, um, especially through the pandemic during which we were at a new issue and, and obviously thanks to Steph as well. So, um, so the issue really um, is mainly organized into two halves. And what Minye just told you guys about was the first half of uh, the domestic politics and the drivers of BRI uh, on the Chinese side. And there's a second half uh, that's looking more at the reactions um, from the recipient countries. Um, but before I get to uh, sort of the second half the issue, I just wanted to take one small step back and I wanted to highlight a bit sort of the, the motivation that we had in um, editing this special issue was that um, for, for a long time, I think still today, a lot of geopolitical, geopolitical concerns and discussions have dominated uh, the rhetoric around BRI. And, uh, and as researchers who have been um, paying attention to how exactly BRI is being implemented in China and, and uh, looking at the projects on the ground and for someone who follow Chinese investment and financing for a long time before BRI was even started, we felt like uh, there it's an oversight to, to focus almost exclusively on the geopolitical implications of BRI and, and really take a more nuanced look at, at the interaction between state and market um, uh, together in the process of, of the Bowder Road Initiative. And, and so that's kind of our motivation to ask the question, you know, um, yes, I mean, this China is a partially liberalized economy. It's an autocracy and the state clearly plays a very important directive role uh, in a lot of economic activities. But how should we really think about um, China's global expansion overseas? Should it be considered state-led, uh, state-dominated, or is it market-driven? And 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 just because, um, as Minya outlined earlier, that you know, and especially in her article, that China has a tri-block system, very fragmented system of implementing BRI, and and ultimately, when we see the activities on the ground, they're primarily commercial. Then doesn't mean that we should entirely consider uh, primarily the BRI 
as, as, as a com commercial initiative. So how should we really think about it? So that was an important motivation for us to engage with this project. And so I just wanted to uh, kind of summarize um, uh, you know, sort of the first half that Minya already covered and sort of take it transition to the second half by highlighting sort of, you know, from a political economy perspective, how we go from this fragment system, fragmented system to what we should expect in terms of political economic outcome, uh, in terms of the investment behavior, as well as impact on the recipients. And, and very simply, I mean, I could summarize it probably uh, with one word, uh, and it is overexpansion. And I'll explain what I mean by that in primarily three ways. I mean, first, when you have a fragmented, fragmented system uh, surrounding such a, you know, a high overarching high level initiative, what we, what we tend to observe is Ben wagoning around the, this nebul nebulous initiative. And, and, and we see, you know, in, in, the, in the first three articles that Mia told us about, we, we see there's uh, always this domestic priority that's driving uh, uh, where the, the direction that BRI is going. Uh, so in some ways, you know, even if you ask people in China, nobody really knows what BRI really is. Uh, and, um, and over time, it has evolved from a project, an initiative that's primarily focused on infrastructure and to now something that's all encompassing, covering Chinese medicine to vaccine diplomacy. Pretty much everything under the sun can be now swept under BRI. And, um, and that is a reflection of the fragment system as well as the prior, a domestic policy priorities ultimately driving uh, the external um, efforts that BRI is putting out. And second is that we observe that, you know, why, why, what, what I mean by overexpansion, that we're seeing that financial backstopping provided by the state would often tend to take, uh, lead to excessive risk taking. Uh, and we see that in um, the contribution, the article I contributed to the special issue that, that's a, a collaborative work with my colleague from grad school, um, Brigitte Saim. Uh, we're seeing that, for example, in Zambia, uh, in, during the global economic downturn, when other um, um, mining companies are pulling out and stopping production. That was the time we see that Chinese companies, state-owned companies are actually acting counter cyclically. And, and that's the time that they are actually buying more assets. And in a way they're able and incentive, incentivized to do that because the ample financial backstop being provided by the state. And more globally, we're seeing, you know, China tends to venture into some of the uh, most risky, riskiest places around the world to invest, ranging from Myanmar to the DRC, uh, is also uh, a, a reflection of that. And third, uh, we are also seeing that in terms of overexpansion, what I mean by that, that the financial guarantee can in turn in not just attract um, Chinese actors to increasingly engage in and in, 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 in turn to bandwagon around BRI, but also international financiers and, and foreign governments. And, and we see in Con and Gallagher article, you know, how this is both a push and the pull uh, forces at play here. Um, and, um, and, 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 and when we talk about debt entrapment, um, at the same time that this is financing offered by the Chinese government, it is also capital that is genuinely demanded uh, by the foreign governments and financiers. And this financial guarantee that people perceive that Chinese companies and, and lenders to have in many ways incentivize people to want to demand um, lending and demand contracts from China. And we've seen uh, in Zambia, for example, on the ground, that uh, suppliers have a preference uh, for working with Chinese companies, especially Chinese state-owned companies, because they understand that payment will never be late and they will always be paid. So, um, so, so, so that's kind of you know what I want to summarize in terms of outcome, what we can expect in terms of overexpansion. Now, what does that mean then? And and 
And that means that geopolitical risk associated with VRI, of course, uh, they are real and they're important, but perhaps more important that we need to be paying attention to commercial risks that could be even bigger, especially now as we head into a period where China's own economy is facing uh, really a lot of pressure in slowing down and Xi Jinping has made financial deleveraging a priority in its economic policies. So um, we're now transitioning to what this model, sort of state-driven um, model for BRI percolated through a fragment system, what that means for recipient economies. Uh, number one is not all bad. Um, again, pointing to the article um, Brigitte and I put in, we were seeing, for example, um, uh, Chinese SOEs are a more uh, stable supplier of jobs uh, and uh, just keeping plants open uh, during economic hard times. And, and, and Minye has also pointed out uh, in the introduction as well as in her own article, I believe that how, how, um, how China's BRI, uh, especially at the current times when a lot of economies are retracting from globalization, uh, is providing a stabilizing force uh, for the global economic globalization process to continue. And so, so it does provide more st stability. It's not all bad. Um, but at the same time, um, I, you know, we're also seeing that because this is a fragmented system and a lot of what was actually happening on the ground is ultimately um, according to commercial logic, what we're seeing that at the same time, analysts and pundits and political scientists may be preoccupied with the geopolitical concerns. Recipients care a lot more about more concrete things uh, like jobs that are actually created uh, or the corporate practices uh, of Chinese companies that are actually practicing uh, on the ground, um, um, which is uh, what the article on Zambia also finds. And, and, uh, and next I'm going to hand it to Audrey who has an amazing article in this issue on Australia, which, is, which sheds further light on how Australian public reacts to uh, Chinese specific practices of economic statecraft uh, in Australia. Thanks, um, Wei-Yi. Floor is yours, Audrey. Hi everyone. Um, thanks to Steph and, and Wei and Min for kind of making making this happen. Um, so kind of you know building on Wei's comments, so she's really highlighted the the economic and, and commercial risks of, of the BRI and of, of China's overseas economic activities. Um, and I'm going to continue the same theme, but perhaps turning a little bit more back to the political impacts um, and looking at the the specific case of Australia, right? But, but I think a lot of my comments are going to drive with with, with Wei's in the sense that. You know, even if we're assessing the geopolitical implications of China's over, you know, economic uh, influ influence or investments, right, that definitely still requires an understanding of what's happening on the ground, right? There's variation in, in recipient country responses, right? And that really matters because we often see that, that China's efforts at economic statecraft um, and at using its capital for political influence, right, often gets caught up in, in local politics and elite politicization. And so this has, actually has been a lot of pushback um, against, against China's economic presence in many parts of the world, right? And so, so economic statecraft is, is actually much less successful than, than we commonly assume, right? And so I'm gonna use the Australia case to illustrate some of these uh, important dynamics in the China's economic statecraft uh, with, with three main points. So the first is that, you know, China's uh, under the ta table approach to buying influence often backfires, right? And this has really kind of worsened um, kind of the reputation of Chinese capital and, and China's overseas investments. Um, second is that there are in, in, in many countries, including Australia, right? There are these strong constituencies uh, that lobby for more cooperative relationship with China um, because, because of nature of economic interdependence, right? The importance of China's economy. Um, and that has helped to sort of uh, you know, induce countries to want to, to maintain positive political ties and help to buffer um, a lot of backlash to some extent. Um, but, but this is increasingly less so uh, today, which, which brings me to my third main point, right, which is that, you know, if China has turned to economic coercion through a more sort of heavy, heavy-handed um, approach to its foreign policy, 
has uh, ultimately undermined the lure of Chinese capital and, and China's use of economic incentives, right? And so in Australia's case, you've seen kind of a much more hawkish turn uh, in its policies uh, towards China, right? And it shows kind of when you're trying to balance kind of using um, yeah, um, economic inducement, economic incentives investments alongside using coercion, right? Car balancing carrots and sticks um, can be uh, really challenging. In terms of my first point, I'm talking a little bit about the backlash against China's economic influence. Uh, you know, very often, not always, but often, right, China, you know, does tend to provide, uh, you know, investments in, in more illicit and opaque ways that circumvent political processes and institutions, right? In other work, I've called this subversive carrots. Um, and, you know, sometimes this is in response to the regulatory, the weak reg regulatory frameworks and institutions in a lot of recipient countries, right, but, but, you know, China has sort of sometimes taken advantage of that, responded to that, and offered provided carrots in, in a way that, that is non-transparent um, and that often breaks the law, right, and so we see in many instances in, in uh, developing countries from, from Malaysia to, to Sri Lanka to the Philippines, right, where Chinese infrastructure investments have often been in use for, you know, allegedly offering bribes, inflating project costs, uh, and bypassing regulations, right? And in Australia case, uh, some of these carrots have taken the form of uh, political donations, right? Where you see Chinese business people reportedly serving as proxies of the Chinese government when making campaign contributions, when donating to politicians, um, in an, a, purported, a purported attempt to really persuade these politicians to advocate more for China's positions uh, on sensitive issues such as the South China Sea uh, and on human rights. Right? And perhaps the most publicized example in Australia is the case where this New South Wales senator uh, with close ties to a Chinese donor uh, called for Canberra not to get involved in the South China Sea issue. Right? He said that you know, the integrity of China's borders, it's a matter for China. And as a friend of China, we, you know, we shouldn't, you know, um, we, we should know when it's out, not our place to get involved, right? And so in Australia, sort of China's um, use of a political donations is also tied to a broader controversy over um, foreign interference activities and influence peddling, right? And this has led to a very strong backlash um, to China's economic presence. Um, the senator was forced to resign. The government implemented a uh, new legislation on political donations and foreign interference. And overall, you know, Chinese capital and Chinese investments are, are regarded much more suspiciously overall, right? The, the government's banned um, Huawei's 5G technology, governments intervene to block acquisitions by Chinese companies, even though, you know, these, these uh, deals actually kind of pass through the, the regulatory um, approval processes. Um, and Canberra has launched uh, a $2 billion infrastructure fund to counter China's economic influence in, in the South Pacific. Right, a lot of this backlash is also driven by, by you know, a lot of perceptions that you know, China is an authoritarian monolith, that there is cohesive state control uh, over outgoing investments, uh, even if in reality, as, as many have mentioned, right, that policy implementation uh, is somewhat, somewhat more fragmented. And so a lot of this backlash um, is, is quite on about turn from just a few years, a few years ago when uh, you know, really the deepening economic ties you know, has traditionally served as somewhat as a buffer against worsening tensions, right? Traditionally, Australian leaders have a lot, you know, sought to juggle the importance of China's economy alongside uh, occasional diplomatic tensions, where China is a major destination for Australian exports, such as iron ore, coal, wine, and dairy. Right? China is also a top source of tourism and higher education revenue for Australia, right? And so we've usually seen, you know, um, over several years, right, there, there are many constituencies within Australia that try to promote a more cooperative relationship uh, with China, and they often criticize uh, the central government, the federal government's policies for being too harsh, right? And so you get kind of um, business people, mining billionaires, sort of, you know, calling for the government to, you know, not to support an international inquiry into, into China's handling of COVID. Uh, you have universities canceling politically sensitive events, such as a visit by the Dalai Lama. Um, or lecturers and being forced to apologize, um, you know, over over you know, actions that sort of undermine China's claims to to territorial disputes, um, and and so and we also have a lot of local and regional politicians, state governments in Australia that have traditionally been eager to support the BRI. Um, you have you know, state local governments sort of signing memorandum of understanding uh, on the BRI with China, um, kind of against what Canberra, what the federal government desires. And so there's a lot of traditionally been a lot of eagerness for, for Chinese investment in Australia. But presently, however, if you look at the last couple of years, right, the voices that are calling for more cooperative economic political relations with Beijing are much more muffled. 
Um, a lot of this is due to sort of China's shift away um, from sort of using uh, investments or using inducements to more uh, overtly uh, aggressive tactics of economic coercion and diplomatic pressure um, since 2020. Right. And so this has actually underscored a lot of fears, right, that Australia's economy is too vulnerable um, uh, to depend on China, too vulnerable to government Chinese coercion, right, and really em empowered more hawkish elements um, in Australian politics. Right. And so this is a new suggestion that, you know, sort of when you kind of thinking about Chinese economic stakeholder more broadly, you have your BRI, but you also have China, you know, becoming more coercive in its uh, foreign policy. But you can see that actually the, the coercive tactics, you know, tend to undermine um, sort of the lure of, of China's China's overseas investments, right? Where, where instead of securing policy concessions, you actually kind of pushing Australia sort of into the, you know, getting to, to deepen its relationship, its security relationship uh, with the United States, right? Signing, signing a new sort of nuclear submarine deal with, um, with the US. Um, and, and so this sort of um, shows how China is, you know, often shooting itself in the foot um, with its ham-handed use of, of carrots and sticks, right? So, so in terms of its use of economic statecraft, right, China's a lot of countries, it's as present economically, um, but you know, whether that actually produces uh, sort of the political influence that China may desire, uh, you know, that, that's still very much an open question. But I'll stop, stop here and, and thanks. Great. Uh, well, thanks very much. I'm sorry I've gone over to my headphones, but there, there's some construction going on outside my office. So to mute the background noise, I thought I'd do this. I had a number of questions that I wanted to pose to the group, but some have already come in over the Q&A. So let me start with a few of those first. So Victor Tian asks about what we mean by economic statecraft. And Audrey, I think I might direct this to you because it's really sort of a definitional question in part. Obviously, this isn't restricted to sanctions. It's, it includes the full variety by which economic uh, ties, including foreign direct investment and lending, can exercise influence. But can you speak to that definitional question? I think it is an important one. Uh, sure, yeah, so uh, first, um, I mean, I, I would define economic state of you know, broadly or conceptually to really be the use of economic tools um, to for geopolitical gain. So if you're trying to you know use foreign aid, use um, overseas investments, um, use trade policies as a way for for the country to increase its political uh, influence um, in the targeted country um, or, or uh, more more globally, right? And I think you're absolutely right that you know this is a lot of times in political science we think about sanctions, right? The U.S. uses sanctions on Iran or North Korea as a kind of a way to pressure countries to change their regime or to change their policies. Um, but I think China's case has certainly shown that the kind of thinking a little bit more explicitly about, you know, inducements and how kind of sort of positive incentives actually can really, you know, change, you know, potentially change the game and change how countries um, um, respond. And that, that's an important angle that I'm um, looking, looking more into. Great. Well, we're starting to get some really good questions, so please uh, feel free to put them into the Q&A. Let me turn to one that's raised by Xiaojia Zhou that I think is really a fair question, which is that if we look at, at the literature on BRI projects, there's a lot of case study work that suggests these projects going wrong and somewhat less work on projects that go right. And we know that there's uh, you know, an infinite demand for, for uh, funding for infrastructure in, in, the, in the East Asian, Central Asia, South Asia region. Do we have any systematic data on levels of corruption in, in BRI projects or is this really impressionistic? And if there is corruption, is there evidence that it's related to the party or is it, as your model would suggest, more related to the activities of firms which are engaged in these kinds of, uh, of influence seeking activities? Minye, do you wanna? Okay, yeah, so that's a very good uh, question. Uh, I also want to add one point on the economic statecraft. I mean, Audrey, of course, uh, leads our research scholarship on uh, China's economic statecraft. But in, in China, there is a bunch of literature 
that's 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 um, uh, indigenous economic statecraft. And uh, I would uh, encourage students or scholars who are interested how China thinks about economic statecraft and look for the Chinese um, literature and how they guide their thinking or using different kinds of uh, economic and even multilateral soft hard instruments to facilitate foreign policy. So there are lots of literature, uh, Chinese literature on this subject. On the uh, corruption, uh, 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 so there are uh, two, uh, number one, I'm uh, uh, being a comparative uh, political scientist, I think a corruption, the definition is vague and it varies across different contexts and uh, corruption, was uh, at the at the at the heart of China's successful uh, uh, openness and reform process. Right? So 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 it depends on the context uh, and 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 how you define corruption. And, and let's uh, uh, so leaving the definitions aside, there are, there are two things that 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 that. That, that outsiders charge China for. Uh, number one is at the national level, uh, China give um, favors or kickbacks or special projects to politicians that the government try to foster. In my opinion, most of powers do that and you foster political uh, favorites in in partner countries that's part of the geo, uh, uh, the power politics around the world but nevertheless that's evidence for charging uh, china uh, playing corruption at the highest level second is at the ground level chinese firms uh, and many we people knows more i also know a fair amount uh, they are entrepreneurs growing up in China, and they are used to using uh, uh, favors, gifts uh, to smooth the process, in particular in, uh, in the developing country, that's how they get things done. So, so that, 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 that's, that, that's happening, uh, but there's, again, no systematic research because corruption, domestic corruption is difficult to capture. Internationally, that's even uh, more difficult. So what the China did was uh, in the 2019 BI summit was to uh, uh, working with the uh, United Nations and different institutions to set up so-called um, uh, financing framework. Right. So if the all project has to go through this multilateral framework, then the Chinese Beijing can say we are not doing, we are following the multilateral rules. And they also created uh, these legal provisions working with lawyers from advanced democracies and see how they can capture corruption on the on the ground. Uh, but that's more for risk mitigation rather than cap caught catching the, the roots of this behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that Wei perhaps knows a lot more by his, his her work. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna come back to that question to you, Wei Yi, because uh, it's coming from someone else. But let me just make an observation on this question from Xiaojia, because I think it's a good one, which is if you were try to try to model this, you would clearly want to take into account the, the conditions surrounding corruption in the target countries because it could be that the level of corruption in projects is a function of the level of corruption in the host country and not just the fact that it's Chinese investment. So I think that's an interesting line of inquiry. Let me turn to something else, uh, Audrey, first and then come back to, to Wei Yi. So Karen Bergen has an interesting question that I'm gonna bundle with one of mine, which is that you know, if I listen to Minier, she's basically saying, look, you know, let's not overestimate how strategic China is, in part because private interests are very much at the table in all of the BRI projects. But Minier, here's a counter to that, which is that even if that's true, once those links are developed, then they become sources of potential influence. And, you know, Audrey, the question to you was, you know, why did China's tactics in, in uh, Australia turn so sharply, you know, from basically more on the positive inducement side 
to something which I'm calling the 14 points, you know, as a historical reference, which is this literally this list of 14 points that was leaked that basically says, you know, China doesn't like this, it doesn't like that, you shouldn't be talking about the South China Sea. And then really using highly coercive sanctions like tactics in order to get movement on those issues. I, I personally think it AUKUS is partly traceable to, to the 14 points. Audrey, do you wanna? Sure, yeah, I, I think I can think of two main reasons, right, kind of why there's this increased turn to coercion. One would be kind of domestically within China, right? I think it's part of a trend where you see the President Xi Jinping kind of uh, encouraging and supporting a more nationalistic, assertive um, sort of approach to foreign policy, right? We have the rise of wolf war diplomacy, where we're, you know, foreign ministry officials and diplomats are rewarded for kind of publicly taking a stance and sort of exercising, you know, what China calls discourse power, right? Basically changing a narrative about China. So I think, you know, and, and there's a lot of sort of emphasis on, you know, trying to maintain the regime's legitimacy in, in the eyes of the domestic public in China, but also, um, um, globally, right, you know, that the CCP is doing a good job, right, and that relates to the second kind of source, which is like, in the last, you know, 2020, right, we, we had the pandemic, and I think sort of these international factors were a major sort of push where China's kind of found itself a little bit, you know, under under siege, where a lot of, there's a lot of criticism by other countries about the way that China is handling things domestically about its model of governance, right, and so I think um, you know, coercion is, is a way that to, the Chinese government can respond more quickly and, sh you know, and show like, I'm, I'm going to try to punish you by putting aside whether it's effective or not, right? It's a way to signal that, you know, we're not happy, we're not going to stand with this. Whereas I think inducements, if you're trying to invest in a country, you, you know, if you're trying to follow their, you know, the proper laws and procedures, right? This is sort of a longer term thing where you have, you know, a, you know, where you kind of have the political payoffs take longer to, to cultivate because you need to work with different, you know, um, economic right. actors or constituencies um, in these recipient countries. And so coercion is a way to sort of demonstrate kind of China's resolve and, and kind of strong response in a very short time period. Yeah, yeah, I, I wanna come back to that, but we, we actually have two questions from Casey Stein and Harris Doshe, which are quite close and they speak to Wei Yi's work. Uh, so Casey asks, do China's coercive tactics have, are they more effective in some settings than others? And, and Casey cites the example, perhaps, that less developed countries are more vulnerable to these kinds of pressures, and maybe just they accommodate more because they don't have the wherewithal to push back than, let's say, in Australia. And Harris Doshe asks a very similar point, you know, is, is to talk a little bit more about this local backlash. Do we do we know anything about how local conditions might influence backlash? So for example, does a country with a freer press, I mean, this would seem quite obvious to me, uh, is it more likely that such a country will see uh, you know, responses from civil society and from the press and media on these issues? Um, yeah, these are great questions. Um, so, um... I, I cannot, unfortunately, I don't think I can answer these questions with systematic empirical evidence. On, I mean, I think it would be um, awesome to be able to collect data on, um, you know, sort of the backlash comparing it across developing and developing economies. Um, and I can only say from the cases that I am familiar with, which is that I think what we tend to see uh, in reports and media, uh, they tend to highlight uh, uh, you know, some of the most acute events uh, in, in terms of public backlash, uh, whether, it, whether it's public protest, whether it's uh, you know, attacks on uh, Chinese personnel working in a certain country. Uh, and those incidents certainly have experienced increase uh, and there has been, you know, relatively speaking, not as much done in terms of collecting public opinion data and comparing them across countries. And um, and then what, what what we have seen on, in a couple African cases that I'm familiar with is that the actual um, overall um, attitude toward China is actually still quite positive. I, I mean, even the, in spite of the, I you know. It, it, 
public, public protests, especially in terms of environment and, and, and labor that are present. But overall, the public are actually um, still the feelings toward China um, are warm and they're cognizant of uh, the contribution that China is making in contributing to local economic development uh, and, uh, uh, and employment. And, uh, um, and of course, you know, the article that's included uh, in a special issue is based on data that's a bit old, um, but bringing in something that's new that, that I'm currently working on, you know, in, in the more recent survey in, in Malawi, and then we find in a survey experiment that actually giving uh, respondents information about Chinese investments uh, in, in the local communities uh, actually serve to move the needle toward an even more warm feeling, uh, warmer feeling toward China. So I think, you know, when we uh, discuss sort of the public backlash uh, against Chinese investment or Chinese economic presence in the country, it is, um, it pays to, you know, take a more nuanced approach and to think about, you know, what, what, what you're reading in the media, which tends to focus on the really acute events uh, versus what the overall um, public opinion might be. Right. Um, so-called myth and reality, what we call yeah, it. Yeah. No, I, I, can't, I can't recommend this paper of Weiyi's enough because it, it looks very closely at the determinants of uh, also of who is responding in what way to these to these kind of incentives. Uh, let me go to a question uh, from Lei Guang and come back to Minier. Um, this is something which does come out in the collection, but can you speak a little bit more to the role of SOEs and the private sector, um, you know, which is obviously coming under tremendous, or at least parts of it are coming under tremendous strain at the moment. Um, are they any longer private? But can you speak to the SOE private? distinction in BRI because that's a that's a big piece of the of the special issue uh, yeah so that's a that's a very good uh, question uh, I, I I think on, on this uh, IP question we perhaps has uh, has more answer but in my uh, observation from the uh, China side uh, the SOEs are uh, are the the funding uh, came from the um, uh, Chinese uh, bank, right? So the Exim Bank and the China Development Bank, as well as some of the local branches of the state banks. So when fundings are, are, are kind of group banks uh, from the state banks, the uh, uh, projects uh, led by um, the industry ministry, ministry uh, liaisons, uh, it, it typically uh, involve the few very important infrastructure um, uh, SOEs. So the uh, construction, railways, power, uh, electricity, bridges, buildings, um, uh, uh, but there are a few that are very large. So uh, private companies, they are kind of default uh, followers of the political leaders, uh, the step, uh, footsteps as they were visiting, promoting BR abroad. So these are also uh, involved. But in general, if we look at the, um, the, the uh, project level procedures uh, from the Chinese procedure, they have open bids, uh, and they what they do is usually they will have um, multiple bids from the local uh, uh, bidders, and then multiple bids from Chinese state-owned companies, and then multiple bids from the private companies. So the idea is they do want to have three types of bidders in each of the projects. So so again, SOE. In, in definitely is in, in the majority by volume, but uh, private companies, bigger ones are in, involved uh, in those projects. A solar panel, for example. Um, I mean, I yeah. can add to that briefly. Please, yeah. Okay, so, um, so I think I'm just, this is in response to Lay's question, right? So, um, so I, I'm gonna offer two, two additional points. One is that um, 
I mean, I don't think, you know, we have a very comprehensive analysis yet whether SOEs and private sectors are attracted to different kind of ERI countries um, with the newer data, um, since um, that data is not very good right now, uh, but with older data, but what we see is that we do see private uh, sector involvement tends to flow more to more advanced economies and better govern economies uh, compared to SOEs. And, uh, and the second point I wanted to offer on that is that um, often we do see that SOEs and private companies can engage in a symbiotic relationship in the sense that you would see that um, SOEs are ones being supported with policy bank financing and so forth going to a country, but then they would generate you know, this local economy for other Chinese suppliers uh, that will opt, you know, they, they would be the subcontractors or they would be the suppliers and so forth surrounding the, the big project uh, that's spearheaded by the SOE. Right. No, this, this actually uh, leads directly into two questions, one from Karen Shu and one from, from Robert. And, and Karen asked a somewhat expansive question about, you know, the, the central role of infrastructure in the BRI, which is the way that this was initially pitched in terms of connectivity. But Robert notes that China also has these very unique advantages in terms of their position in global supply chains. And I was wondering if, if one of you, uh, just raise a hand or jump in, could speak to uh, the centrality of infrastructure or whether the BRI is evolving in a direction of also trying to build uh, you know, independent um, supply chains that may not be vulnerable to, to pressures from, uh, from the West. It's not clear to me where those would be located, frankly, because it seems to me the risk <laughs> along the BRI corridors, the political risk is extraordinarily high. But um, can one of you speak to that? Uh, okay, maybe I'll just uh, start. Uh, number one, uh, uh, infrastructure is still a big part, but infrastructure, there are different infrastructure, right? So the early BRI, that's railways and, and big uh, ports, and those are much, much less feasible. Uh, but now it's uh, uh, electricity, water, utility, bridges, uh, highways, and smaller uh, that can kind of improve the connectivities between nodes. So this goes back to the, the, the shift in the, in the guideline. That, that is the, 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 from, from Beijing, the idea is BRI uh, should uh, help restructure the supply chains. Uh, as well as a dual circulation. So it's a, a, a how goods from overseas can be more integrated inside China or goods in different parts of China can be more integrated. So these two supply chain restructuring and, uh, uh, and a dual circulation are the two big guidelines from the, the, from the center. Uh, but I, as, as we show in, in this issue, uh, they have the guidelines, but bottom up how that's going to be worked out, uh, that's up to the, the, the SOEs, private companies, localities, they have no right. answer how to do, how to do this. Um, the Chinese, the state-owned enterprise in particular is a bigger one, right? The construction company, the electrical building company, they, they themselves is a huge supply networks. So I've seen in the COVID, the pandemic, they actually re-energize the different parts of supply chains just for the, for the network within the state-owned companies to work. And, and it will be interesting to watch how they shift. Right. Well, listen, as I expected, the time has just flown by. It's just been a great discussion. I want to leave uh, you with one question for everyone on the call to ponder, which is that Alan Zhang has a very interesting question, historical question. He basically says, look, is this really any different than what the United States did? You know, it poured a lot of foreign direct investment into Europe, into Latin America, into East Asia. It had broadly geopolitical objectives, but it was also motivated by private actors' concerns. I mean, I think it's a, a quite clever question. But I wanna close by giving each of you a response, uh, an opportunity to respond to a question from Paul Evans, uh, 
um, at UBC who asks a really good question in the chat. He says, should we expect the, the complexity and nuance of your study to have an appropriate policy response or policy influence? Uh, or to put it a little bit differently, you know, what are the lessons of this project for understanding Chinese objectives um, and what they've accomplished through the BRI strategically, even if it isn't controlled quite as tightly as Minier suggests. So maybe um, each of you could just take a minute, Audrey, start with you, to reflect on, on whether the BRI is working for China or whether it's a net been a negative in terms of PR. Uh, sure, that's that's a that's a big one. Um, well, I so I think I think you would say net. I think definitely kind of start in this immediate and and kind of medium term. Right, I think we've talked about there's been a lot of pushback, a lot of skepticism, um, and concern about sort of the BRI, and and I think that that kind of demonstrates right that the way that off China off you know often offers its carrots right. Um, you know, is not not in the manner that a lot of these recipient countries want, whether in terms of kind of providing local jobs or or you know adhering protecting the environment, um, and, and so in that sense, I think a lot of times China has you know I think in many ways the BRI has has backfired, um, but of course I think you know China's economic presence is here to stay. I think this gets another question in the, in, in the Q and A, right? Where there, you know, I think China is 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 learning, right? And so I think it's responding to sort of this foreign criticisms. It's it's kind of been renegotiating with some countries, in Malaysia, for example, kind of trying to trying to kind of build up the reputation of its of its projects and trying to kind of work with more more local actors in some countries, right? And and so obviously that's a learning process, and China's a big shift to turn around, right? Whether it's able to control all of its commercial actors, right, to follow the laws, another question. But I think there is, you know, there are some signals, right, that BRI 2.0 is more about cooperating different uh, third party cooperation and, and trying, you know, to reduce corruption. And so I think those are um, signs that that China is is adjusting, um, albeit slowly. Thanks, Audrey. Min, if, if we can just keep you to a minute. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, I, I, I want to underscore uh, in the in the article in the in the book as well, uh, that is BRI was motivated to address domestic crises. Okay, so there, there's there's a severe pressure in industrial overcapacity, the difficult to for economic restructuring, and also the strategic conflict with the U.S. with region. So we 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 kind of now in retrospect we think BRI was not uh, achieving all these given uh, lofty goals, uh, but it, at, the, at the moment it, it addressed a, a, the, 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 the challenges that the Beijing faced. So from domestic po point of view, it was uh, really a brilliant uh, strategy. Uh, number two is externally, China was, and BI as well, is playing a long game. They're not thinking about dominance control in one spot overall, rather it's building connectivities and, uh, and, and some kind of partial influence, friends, circles of friends um, and, and, and prosperity if they, they can be uh, achieved. And the last point I want to echo uh, Audrey and uh, I'm working on the uh, BRI 3.0, uh, that is a Chinese own learning, the institutional capacity building is just enormous, enormous in the last uh, uh, few years. And, and thanks to the BRI and the pushback from different parts of the world. Wei Yi, next to the last word, and then I'll leave you with one closing thought. Okay, um, I think I, I may have slightly less rosy view than than Min and Audrey of the BRI. I mean I I, I completely agree that, that China has been adapting and there has been learning going on. Um, but I also think that China still is constrained by the nature of its political economy system. And I also want to highlight the fact that you know the the continuity of China's uh, the globalization of China's economic footprint around the world. It did not start with the BRI. Uh, it's been going on for a long time, the go out policy. And then Xi Jinping came in and had this 
you know, personal endeavor to make BR, calling it BR, start calling it BRI and then making it right. his personal legacy project uh, and uh, putting this foreign policy spin uh, onto it. And I'm not sure, you know, um, and transitioning a primarily economically driven initiative like Go Out to um, BRI and, and being explicit about its foreign policy ambition really is at this point doing China uh, any favors. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, but everything else is still, I mean, the commercial nature of it still exists and it is still going forward. And I think it's still playing a positive role in terms of satisfying uh, China's domestic economic priorities and also playing a role in sustaining global economic openness, especially at a time when the entire world is kind of retrenching from that. Uh, all that withstanding, I'm not sure, you know, calling it BRI and putting the foreign policy spin on it really is uh, China's best move um, in the Great. last year. Great. Well, listen, we do have to wind up. I'm just going to leave with two questions in the chat that suggest that this debate is going to continue. Chris Toomey makes a very interesting point that I actually agree with, that standard setting could be a very important piece of what the BRI is doing and a kind of lock-in. And then on the other hand, Susan Shirk makes this very interesting point that even though this is an incredibly high profile and even vanity project of Xi Jinping's, the, the way it's organized is this small office in the NDRC, which I think actually confirms Minier's analysis that when you talk about the internal politics of BRI, it's just much more complex and not under the control of any one commission, <laughs> since Xi Jinping sits on the top of about 20 of them at the present. Okay, thanks very much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, do we have a slide on some things that are coming up? Uh, yeah, let me just mention these very quickly. February 3rd, Li Xiang, Anxious China. Uh, February 11th, uh, Keping Chen on national identity in the COVID era. And February 17th, uh, a discussion of the low carbon energy system in China. So we look forward to you joining those future events. I'm Stefan Haggard. It's really a pleasure to see you at this webinar. So long. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.